now. All right. Hi, everybody. <laughs> All right. We have a question that we just received. Um, it's from Pablo. It said, can you suggest techniques to help resist the temptation of cravings and relapse? And this is one that we get a lot. Oh, that's for a sure. A lot. So, uh, and, it, and it really does illustrate the serious misunderstanding um, that there is in, in, about addiction in general. You know, that, that cravings and uh, something that just happens to you. It's something that you don't have control over. Um, and the truth is you actively crave. Yeah, you crave because of the, the way you perceive alcohol and drugs and the benefits they provide you. Um, but Steve, why don't you start us off uh, talking about cravings and relapse? Oh yeah, sure. So that, um, it's funny what you guys both just brought up, um, that you actively crave rather than getting a craving or craving right. happening to you. We put that in uh, chapter three, a little discussion of that. Right. And I was pretty shocked that that became one of the things that people responded to most in the book that I keep hearing back from people. They say, you don't get cravings. You actively crave again and again and again. People say that made so much sense to me. Yeah. Um, so what do we mean by get a craving? Right. But think about that. The question was phrased how? How was the question that came in phrased? Can you suggest techniques to help resist the temptation of cravings and relapse? Resist the temptation of cravings and relapse. So there's a little bit of everything in there. Yeah. You know, I, I, I like that because it's a really great know, question. Yeah, temptation is usually seen more as like that's some an internal process, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's kind of cool that he has that. In the way he's already thinking, it's not fully like I'm fighting a craving, right? It's that he's tempted, right? And that means attracted to the thing. So that's that's really interesting. But um, but the so the way that we always get it in rehab is is well, you get cravings. Your brain has changed, and that sends you cravings. And it's always like a craving is a thing that we are battling. Right, that there is a battle within the individual, like you, there are two people within the mind of the individual, you know? Yeah, two people or the the demonic drug, right? Or possessing you. Right. There's, there's a battle. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, what would you say? Like, you know, there's there's somehow this notion, I can remember thinking this way when I, when I first got sober, so to speak, was that there was all of this stuff out there about that the drug would get into your fat cells yeah. and then if you released it, you would get a craving. That was, or, a, that was a big 80s thing. <laughs> right, or, yeah. you, or even it wouldn't just be that, you'd have like flashbacks and then you'd get a craving from that. Again, that was the, the <laughs> Saturday morning specials on drug effects that yep. you, would, you would watch on a Saturday morning special. Do you yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. And, and like the kid having the flashback in school, freaking out, you know, because it came out of his fat cells. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, yeah, the fat cells thing has also become a big Scientology thing, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, that's why you spend right thirty days, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, in saunas when you go to Narcanon or whatever. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's it's but, all it's all crap, by the way. Just yeah, saying. Just, yeah. <laughs> well, well, this is the this is the central. It's a central fear and, and problem in a lot of ways. A lot of people can get over and past the like, well, yeah, I do have control, but, but they still sort of think about it as this battle against cravings as something that takes some strength or something. And, and, and for me, I always, once I started to believe the, the sort of my brain has been hijacked and with heroin, there's like this, this uh pandora i don't know if it's the right term but a pandora's box thing like once you've opened that box you're always going to crave this like it's got you you're always right. going to want it for the rest of your life and so that's very scary and for me um uh, quitting was always tough because it's like well, i'm living with this nagging want every day and i'm fighting that or giving into it right one or the other and we 
in the freedom model, we are completely um, ending the conversation about a battle against cravings or addictions and taking those two separate, you know, like two separate wills. I want to stop, but I want to, you know, we're combining them into one in a way, right? And saying like, if this is really what you want right now, it's really what you want right now. And you didn't lose a battle against it. It didn't overpower you. It, it's what you wanted if you went and used, right? Yeah. Um, but a thought of using is not an imperative to use, right? Um, and we, as you started out saying, Mark, we, we want to drink or drug because of we see it as the best option. That's a very good cool option. Right. At the at moment. The, yep. But where we where people get really hung up is that then they're habitually using, right? It's yeah. like at one point you thought, oh, it's really fun to get very drunk when I party, right? And then you thought, well, it might be drunk, it might be fun to be drunk here and there and then the next place. And then yeah. I get it's then it becomes at some point it's the only way I have fun, right? And so every time it's time to have fun, you will automatically think of a uh, of getting a drink, you know, and you don't think it out. You don't think it would be fun if I had a drink right now. And you know what I mean? Like it, it's, you don't think, you don't necessarily think those words, right? You just like, it's drink time. Give me a beer, right? Or, or whatever. And, and so you're not really thinking it out. And so, so, but this happens with like a million things in life, right? Where we just automatically think, it's like when I start eating healthy for a while, I'll stock up the house with fruit and cheese instead of like Starburst jelly beans and Hostess cupcakes and all that, you know, all that stuff that I love. And, and you know, at first it's like a little work to transition to like, like yeah. all right, I got to like keep this up, you know. And then it's like, then I just want the fruit. I want the cheese, right? And, 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 and I, don't have to, I don't think it out. I don't weigh out the things, right? Um, well, that same thing of being like, well, I want a piece of watermelon, which we consider healthy and good. It's a healthy habit, right? <laughs> we consider that good and, and, and it becomes automatic for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. We consider it's that, a good but if you, if you think that way about a beer, that's a powerful craving. It's right. going to overpower you, right? It's been cast as something else. That's, where I want to bring this conversation, right? Is that that's kind of the difference? That's right. Do you think? I do. I do think that, and I think that. Let's go back for a second to <laughs> this idea of a dual mind, right? That sure. when people talk about cravings happening to them, and that it's a struggle, a power struggle within them, what you're really saying, and I want the audience to think about this, is what you're really saying is I have two people inside of me. Now, what's funny is when I've had people in class, they say, oh my God, Mark, it is like that. And I say, it's only like that because that's what you learn. That's right. Okay. If you learned exactly. that, that you actually have a preference for the drug and that you find benefit in that drug at that moment, that you prefer it because it has some sort of benefit to you at that moment, and the benefits may be small. Don't get me wrong. You may get to the end of, of your, your drinking and drug life and be tired of it. And so it becomes a, a more difficult choice to make, you know, because the consequences are greater or whatever. Um, but it's not a battle until you define it as a battle. Yeah. Really what it is, is just, do I really want to keep doing this? And if, and I guess that's what the freedom model does. It gets you to, to let go of the battle image. That's yes. that there are these dual minds at work inside of you, a broken brain, get rid of all that. Cause it's not true. And we, 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 we hammer that throughout the book, the science that refutes all that. So what you're left with is a choice that's based in a preference that's well-learned habitual and habitualized the habitual thoughts that come along with it. Like when it's time to have fun, I want to drink. Yeah, right? because that's, that's what you learned. That's or, what you did a thousand times. I want to drink. Yeah, I've had a bad day. I want to drink. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. 
right? So, and so when that automatic thought comes, as opposed to going and grabbing the grapes or the watermelon or the almonds, is bad. You're reading that. You're reading that comment there. Yes. <laughs> That's a good one. When I stock my home full of health foods, I black out and end up in the drive-thru at Wendy's. I think I'm powerless. <laughs> well, that's, that's perfect. And that was perfect. and that was to the point that Steve made that it's only with certain substances that we see it that, that way. We see right. I just got a that text. Is, my friend is on Jeopardy tonight. I'm missing <laughs> <that>. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> so it's only with it's only with these substances that we morally in this culture say is wrong to enjoy heroin, beer, all these things that we would say what, what Matthew just said. When I stock my home full of health foods, I black out and end up in the drive through at Wendy's. I think I'm powerless. That would be ridiculous. It's of course it's ridiculous. It's just as ridiculous to say you're powerless over heroin. Now, yeah. that's. And I want you to think about that. It is just as ridiculous. But our culture has been pushing that narrative for 80 years, really a little longer than that, but 80 years, a hardcore movement. Um, so, and it's yeah. created an entire industry to try and fix the myth, you know? And so then AA around the word craving, right? They said the phenomenon of craving. Yes. Right. Yeah. It gives it a they, and they need it. So we we built up just a standard thing that happens every day in life around every kind of habitualized activity that we have, which is you automatically think, I want that, I need that right now, whatever, without weighing it out. Because you weighed it out before. You've made yeah. it a habit. Yeah. So this is this is this is this is a normal, normal thing. But with a drug or alcohol. We are taught to believe that it is foreign to us. Yeah. It's it's not who we are. It's a disease that that sends this craving. It's that our brain is hijacked. I mean, these are some crazy big words, big negative words, right? Yeah. We're seeing it all through this negative lens, and it becomes something to fight and to battle and that you can't deal with on your own. And so what you what I think you're saying, Mark, is the first step is to just understand it's 100 percent norm. It's yeah, it's absolutely it's no different than any other choice that you make. So, and yeah. now the consequences may be different or more painful. Um, and, I, you know, I've used this analogy for years that I boxed and, you know, the consequences. I knew what the consequences were getting in the ring. Right. I mean, you get knocked out sometimes and it's it's painful. Um, it's not like a drinker or a drug taker doesn't understand the risks. My God, we talk about the risks to, to kids in school at six years old. It's hammered home. Right. Everybody knows what the risks are. So the people that are involved in the health industry should be asking themselves if we can't scare people into into stopping this use or moderating, then maybe we should try something else. And really, that's one of the things that we did. 30 years ago that I did and Michelle and the people involved at that time was, you know, there's, we got to look at this differently. And what I realized was I like to get high. Even at the end, when I was doing it, I could always find that I was making a choice to get drunk or high because I found value in that experience. And when I didn't have that value anymore, when it wasn't important to me, it wasn't that fun. Um, I stopped. You know, because I didn't frame it as something that was a compulsion against me, you know, um, that it was some other force that was separate from my consciousness. Right. And if it is something that is separate from your consciousness that happens to you like a disease, like a pathogen, you're doomed. You really are in need of treatment forever. And that's 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 the two views, folks. You know, you can't have it both ways. I love these non 12 step programs that took our model, the non 12 step, actual non 12 step model. And then and then they play the disease side kind of as a, it's a sort of a pseudo disease, you know, it's a metaphorical disease. Right. And 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 you, you really do need recovery and you can't have it both ways. Either it's a choice or it's a disease. There can't be a melding of those two things. And, and, and when people do that, that's real dangerous ground because it's in half truths that kill people, yeah. you know, because it keeps them trapped for longer than they need to be trapped. So, oh, yeah. uh, 
So yeah, I, I want to bring it back awesome. around to answer the question. Um, you know, so are there techniques, uh, actual techniques to resist temptation of cravings and relapse? I mean, it, I, I guess the technique would be to first learn exactly what a craving is and, and learn exactly what addiction is and what it's not. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think that the technique is to know the truth which is a craving is nothing more than a habitual thought that it would be that you would be happier to to drink or drug right at that moment and and then you know decide would i really be happier well that's that that's the technique right yeah. well yeah the the technique is is called decision making yep and we do it every day and so that's that why we're really a little us three here are very scared to call it a technique we don't like yeah. this idea of getting, we're trying to say first of all you're going to approach it like everything else in life um and i um i, I want to say this habits are are very easy to break when you have no more mo, no motivation to follow through on them anymore right and the example that I use is um, when I moved my office from from like Madison Park up to Bryant Park. All of a sudden, I, I used to take I used to um, transfer on the subway train to go down to Madison every morning. And then now now that I moved the office, I had to just stay on the same train and keep going towards Bryant Park, Times Square area. Well, for the first two weeks. I kept on transferring and going downtown. <laughs> and the yeah, first time, like, I went right up to the door, to the lobby, and I'm like, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> like, what is this? You know, but I have my headphones in, I'm listening to my podcast, or the yeah. app, like reading Kindle. You know what I mean? And I'm not, I'm just, I'm just acting automatically, get off that train and go. And, and basically, there was just this gradual know. process it's over two weeks where I would get instead of to 23rd, I would go to 28th street and be like, Oh, going the wrong way. Turn around <laughs> or <laughs> head to 33rd, grand central. It was just so dumb. And, um, but one thing that never happened during that process was that I never said to myself, I'm addicted to coming to this building at Madison that's that's I, you got to stop there because that is such an important point that you just made you didn't say i am powerless to go to yeah. my old office now what if you had right what if yeah. you had told yourself that you were powerless to go to your office what if you were taught since you were six years old that you couldn't stop going to that old office yeah. you liked that old office so much yeah exactly you would never be able to change your preference you were always going to go to that old office you were destined to because everybody that ever went to that office always yeah. went back to that office. <laughs> I mean, it's, right? It's so, it's so yeah. It's so yeah. crazy. So but this yeah. habit part of things. Yes. So, and I'm dealing with it right now with this. I know, I think I mentioned this in our last talk, but I had to change my computer password. I had the same password for seven years on this computer and I had to change it like two months ago. And a lot kept going at the same oh, thing. Yeah. It, it's just taken longer because I would press that in how many times every day? Every time I woke the computer up, it, it would be, I would be, you know what I mean? And so I've, I've had yeah. to deal with that. So this is just so normal. Now, the thing I want to say is that there was no, I didn't have any students to meet with at the old office. I had no reason to be there. So even though I kind of, you know, like kept going in that direction by habit. It was very, it was still very easy to break it because there was no reason to go there. Right. I had every reason to go to the Bryant Park office, the new one. And so with, with a, a drug or alcohol problem, do you have reasons to keep using the drugs or not? Do you have motivation? Right. So there's two parts of it. On the, on the one hand, we get mindless and habitual about things. Um, but on the other hand, um, there's the motivation part. It's what do I like about these drugs? Do I like being sober or less intoxicated better? 
And that all needs to be looked at. So the technique is to face the facts and the truth about that, to reanalyze your options and say like, like, well, yeah, I, I usually have fun by getting wasted, but maybe I could have fun a different way than that, you know? Or, you know, break that down. It's gonna be, obviously it's, it's gonna be in different, there's gonna be different issues for everybody's yeah, drug. Everybody has different reasons. Everybody, that's exactly it. Everybody has different reasons for use. And if those reasons are very powerful reasons to that person, if that person, for instance, is a very depressed person and they believe that alcohol pharmacologically relieves depression, well, then my God, they have a heck of a motivation to continue drinking. Yeah. Now, we break that down in the freedom model that pharmacologically it can't do that. And there's a whole variety of reasons why it can't pharmacologically relieve depression. Um, but, but if you believe that, then you're very motivated to continue to drink. Yeah, so, and, and it's not, if you're still heavily motivated to drink, it's not an issue of habit. It's an issue of why are you so damn motivated here? And like, and would you be motivated to change? It's it's not, like that's, this is where it gets tricky for people, well, right? It's, you, it, you can't, it's not enough to say it's just habit because it's not, it's the, it, it's also the motivation. It's the ideas, the reasons that support using and that tell you nothing else is gonna be better. And so I, now methadone helped me to break my habit of running around, stealing things, <laughs> selling them for money and getting heroin every day. I, I totally broke the habit because I was not in withdrawal, right? And, and I was motivated to change a bit because I didn't want, didn't want to go to jail. I was on a suspended sentence and I did that again and again and again, and whatever, probation. And and I changed the hab all the habits, but still the desire to use stayed there at some level. And and it stayed with me for all those five years that I was in and out of rehabs. The 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 easiest way I can boil it down, I know it's not this simple for everybody, but it really was this there was the only thing that will make me happy in this world is heroin. That was the way I saw it. Yeah, because you were taught that. You, you, because you were taught that because our our culture now pushes that narrative so sure. hard for that that if you if you take heroin once, you're going to love it for the rest of your life, which as we know isn't true. Yeah. Um, well, and you and you learned it in the rehab, and you learned it. Yeah, right. yeah. and so yeah. as long as I saw my options that way, which is a life of misery with no heroin or a life of a heroin high and a lot of problems then and and some happiness well then then i was always going to want heroin and um and so it didn't matter that i changed the habits temporarily right i right. changed the mindset that that drove me to keep using so if there was a if there was a technique that we use it's not only the truth but it's mining for what your belief is about the drug, um, what your motive behind getting high is, what do you believe the drug actually does to you and for you, right. what's the utility and futility of it. And, and so, um, so when, you, when you look at what drugs actually do, what you find most of the time is that it's your beliefs that are driving your, your supposed need for it. You know, it's it's that you believe it's taking care of your depression. It's because you believe it cures your anxiety. It's because you believe of these things. Now, with heroin, for instance, you have withdrawal, like like Steve talked about, and it does stave off withdrawal. So that's that's a legitimately good reason to do heroin, right? I mean, if you don't want to go into withdrawal, then you do heroin, you won't have withdrawal. But here's the other side of that. You could go through withdrawal for three days and be done with it forever. I mean, it's, it's it's not going to kill you. Nothing tragic is going to happen. You'll be sick for three to five days, and then you can move on with your life as long as you don't hold on to all the other mythology. And that's what people did before the disease concept, by the way, not the fact, the concept of disease came on the picture, which is a huge distraction from the truth. And the truth is people have been physically dependent on heroin for thousands of years and they simply moved on they because they didn't get distracted over here with all this other nonsense the stuff that wasn't true
So I think if there's a technique, it's knowing the truth and also understanding your reasons as to why you like it at some level. I always say some fundamental level, you like it when you're doing it. Well, and, and this is the truth too. We're talking about truth, truth, truth. That's different right. Plant, different categories of it. Now, I want, to jump, I want to jump in because I think the word relapse is a perfect segue here. We've talked about cravings and relapse. Think about the word relapse. What does relapse mean? It means that something is happening to you. You are relapsing into a behavior or a disease. It's disease terminology. Right, that it happens to you that you don't actively do. Mm -hmm. That's what relapse implies. Exactly. So when we got this question, I, I my heart sank a little bit because I knew I used to say things like this and I was so horribly confused. Why do I relapse? Why do I relapse? Right. And nobody ever said to me, nobody walked up to me in the treatment centers and said, listen, Mark, you relapse because it's not a relapse. You're just choosing it. Right. You know, and when I say just choosing it, there's a lot behind that. Don't get me wrong. My choice there was I was obviously very motivated because I got drunk a lot. So I was very motivated. So to get drunk or high a lot doesn't happen without a serious motivation to do so. And we were ignoring all that. Right. In treatment, they were just saying, just relapse. So like it, it, it just happens to you. All of a sudden, I'm struck out in the street with a phenomenon of craving. And it's all just kind of this big whirlwind happening around me. And the truth is, I really valued that experience. And nobody was saying, hey, Mark, why do you value that? Why do you like it? Well, and nobody was saying it for a couple reasons, though. I mean, you're not supposed to like it. Like, yeah. I, I've talked about point. that is, you know, I can remember we, when I was first in AA and people were like talking about relapse, talking about relapse. And I and I would always pose the question, what is going to happen that's going to make me drink again against my will? Like, I would think I would have to want it. Like it, To me, that was a perfectly obvious question. Like, I would have to, they'll be like, no, it'll just, things will happen. It'll just happen to you. And and it just made no, I was it confused me because by then I didn't like it anymore. Yeah. And so I couldn't, but I remember being at a meeting. I remember being at a meeting. It was late summer and, um, and somebody was talking about this billboard on, 890 and it was a bottle of beer and it and i don't even like beer by the way and <laughs> it was a bottle of beer and it was like all the the sweat the sweat on the beer bottle was dripping down and they were talking about it at the clubhouse in schenectady God. and they were like this that billboard is just making me want a beer so bad <laughs> and so i can remember trying to looking at it and i'm like no <laughs> no, no, well, it does kind of make me want a cold beverage. But, <laughs> but like he was talking and I felt like I remember feeling badly because that's when it first occurred to me, oh, he still likes being drunk. That's exactly. and I didn't anymore. Yes. And so here is everybody telling me, you know, because I well, I did everything I wasn't supposed to do, got involved in a relationship very early, took off and went to Virginia Beach with this guy from AA and I ended up marrying him. We're still married, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but almost 30 years together, by the way. Um, and, uh, but I remember everybody telling me that relapse was just going to happen to me and thinking that it was that I, I didn't get it. I never understood it. And, and I was called a lot of names because and, of that. And, you know, <laughs> and you know, what's great about your experience is for the amount of AA that was in your life and, and yes. from your family, it's, it's, remarkable that you kept your own autonomy yeah you know? it is and, and if i i i just wrote i an was article. too logical yeah <laughs> I, I just wrote an article that when i hear somebody call a parent will call us for the freedom model right for one of our retreat experiences or whatever and they'll say ah oh, our son jack he just won't give in to the program and yes. now i know what the parents are saying they've been they've been told that the reason their son jack is relapsing is because he won't give himself to the simple program. He won't give in to the steps, you know? And and I immediately respond to these parents by saying, thank God Jack didn't. Yeah. And they're like, what? And yeah. then I'll say, well, I'm really happy that Jack has, has kept the gusto to be able to reject the idea that he's some hapless victim. That's a wonderful thing. Jack has a real chance to move on 
from yeah. all of this. And you know what? He's halfway there. He's halfway there because he's holding on to his autonomy. He's saying this doesn't make sense. I'm not weak. I'm not this. I'm not that. I want to get high. I can stop on my own, right? Parents get terrified when they say, oh, Jack said he can stop on his own, but he doesn't. Well, yeah, that's because Jack likes it. He still and then, likes it. And then I say, let me talk to Jack. And then I find out that the parents, I'm not sure. I get on the phone with Jack and Jack's like, dude, I don't, I don't really want to get sober. <laughs> you know, he's yeah. like, I really don't. I, I, I don't want to do the rehab thing, but I'm being forced by my parents to do this and to talk to you. And I say, you know what? You can get off the phone. Just get our book. You're going to be fine. Don't go to rehab. Don't do the steps. Avoid all of it, Jack, because you're on the road to guiding your life in a pretty good direction. You know, and that is against everything the treatment industry says, literally. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and it, yeah, it's scary, though. I mean, yeah. if you're a parent and you've got a kid that's going down that path, I, I get how scary it is. But what we have to say is the very worst thing that they can do is start to believe that they are out of control. Um, because I can remember being told when I told when there was a kind of intervention done with me um, six months before I, I got sober, so to speak. Um, you know, the very worst thing you can say to somebody is, is you're powerless and out of control and make them believe that and force them to do something they don't want to do. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a double edged sword. I'm going to, I'm going to force you into rehab where they're going to tell you that you're doomed and powerless. And, and here I, you know, you're a young person, you've got your whole life ahead of you. Yeah. Um, and I actually said, I can take it or leave it. And then I was told that that was my denial or oh, your disease talking it to you. my disease talking i can That's take it. it or leave it <laughs> no it's good you believe that it's good you believe that <clears throat> back <laughs> then it happened to you back good. then that, that i i had a flashback i want to tell you i <laughs> i woke up the other day and i was thinking oh my god i was i thought about high watch farm uh oh, where i went god. To oh. and i thought about how at that time, it was 1997, and I know you did this earlier, but it, it, that was an era, you know, and that this was the end, this was sort of towards the end of the era, but do you remember, it? everything used to be, basically, whether you were going to, whether you are a real alcoholic or addict or not. Yeah. Yes. That was entirely, they they control the narrative at rehab and you get to, and, and, and it was whether you are going to accept, like either realize maybe you're not, you know, they'd always do it. Well, maybe you're not, I don't know. Yeah. So yeah. Try to control, drink, control drinking. We'll see what happens. You know, our hats off to you. Chuckle, 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 chuckle. <laughs> yeah. Right. There was some of that. Right. And then, so then it was sort of like, and you know, whether you're going to come to terms with the fact that that's really what you are. And it was like, that was the entire question. And there were people that came back to High Watch Farm. And this was my first time at, you know, really being exposed to this stuff. And I'd be like, well, why, you know, like, why are you back? And they're like, well, I, you know, I guess I, I just never really accepted that I was a real al alcoholic. And now I do. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's and you better accept moment. it now. What? Mm -hmm. That's a tragic moment. Yeah, and that conversion takes place. From and that was entirely what it was back then. Yeah. It was just about whether you were going to accept that or not. And there was only one game in town, and it was, you know, accept that. And okay, well, just now we know what your life is. It's it's going to be going to these meetings every day and resisting. And oh, you're going to no. now, Steve. Let me jump in. Yeah. What is, what is the trend now? The trend now is. Uh, are you going to resist going on to medically assisted therapy? And instead of going to a meeting, now you're going to the methadone clinic. Sure. Right. Yeah. Or both. I right? Think. right. Or now I both. Yeah. Counseling. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so now, see, now this is the thing. Um, and I, I know I'm veering far away from the question, but I've thought about this a lot. This is good. It, but the narrative has changed to, look, it's not just AA. There's all kinds of addicts. Addicts are on a spectrum. Yeah. There's all kinds of treatments. So now, like, so it used to be, it used to be very black and white. And you could see through, you know, like if, if your situation wasn't so desperate, you could see through the bullshit and be like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not 
Um, no, I'm definitely not one of these people. Yeah. Therefore, I don't have the disease and I don't need the solution because there was only one solution. Now you're barraged with there's 50 different solutions and there's a whole range. And maybe you're not that kind of an addict, but you're a different kind of an addict. But we all accept that we're addicts now. Right. Yes. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, oh, and yeah, this, yeah, yeah. this is what's fucking scary to me. I'm well, sorry. Well, I'm scaring again. But. That's okay. But you're bringing up such an important point, And that is, I'll get, you have all the different treatments. Yeah. Some called treatments. Maybe this one will work. Maybe, maybe if I get, um, you know, rapid eye movement, um, trauma therapy or whatever, where I to move my eyes back and forth. Right. Maybe that will stop my craving. Right. right. Maybe if I go to a support meeting, that will stop my craving. Maybe if I get on antidepressants, that will stop my craving. Maybe if I do this, do that, if I get right, like now we have all it, really the, the idea behind, behind every one of them is that they're going to address the cause. Yes. Yeah. Yes, the underlying, right. the underlying deep seated trouble that whatever it is, whatever's making you crave, right? right? We, we have 50 different treatments, but 50 is small. That's a small word. We, we, in small number, we have thousands of people right. with treatment ideas, different treatment ideas, but they're all based on the premise that the craving happens to you and that the relapse will happen to you that the relapse will just happen. You'll be out in the street with a needle in your arm. It'll just happen. I think we've lost the gimmick to combat that. What? Uh, for a second, we lost you. You were, you were, you were frozen in time. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. But yeah. so they're going to combat that cause in some way. And so this question is asking and it's saying, okay, free to model Mark, Steve and Michelle. Um, what's your gimmick to get rid of? Right. Yeah. And to What's stop the relapse, to end the relapse, deal with the relapse and prevent relapse. It is to just recognize, stop playing this damn charade. You're not addicted. You're doing what you want to do. You're also acting on habit. There's a lot of misinformation out there in the world that has gotten you freaked out. And so you get all irrational the moment that you start thinking about drinking or taking a drug because that's you've been taught that you're facing a disease and it's a hard over hard to overcome overpowering thing. And so you get freaked out, you go to panicville and you go to a irrationality now because of all the misinformation you've been fed throughout your life about addiction. So it's to extract yourself from that charade, see this as a decision, own it. If you're going to use, use, if you want to stop, but you're still feeling a pull, then think, think to yourself, okay, well, what do I really like out of this and get out of it? Will it be so bad if I don't go without it? Right. But now what people also don't realize is the binary of either you're using or you're out of control using, or, you know, you quit everything. People look at that. They don't realize that makes them more attracted to drugs because, and this is the funniest thing, right? People always say that addicts don't think long-term, right? And, and they do, we do think long-term. We think I'm going to have a boring 50 fucking years ahead yeah. of me. If I don't buy <laughs> drugs today. Yeah. I am, or this is what I rely on every time my kids are driving me nuts. And they're only four years old at this point. I have 14 more years <laughs> of this crap. No, no, no. If, I quit, if I quit drinking, how will I deal with their shit? Right? <laughs> we do things long term. Yeah, well, here, Steve. And, and you're telling us we have to totally give up. And it's always made us this big momentous thing. And right. that's, that scares people shitless. And they just want, they're like, all right, screw it. And then I'm just an alcoholic. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I what? see on all of the, uh, you know, the, the message boards and things like that, these leaving AA groups, a new member will come in and they'll say, uh, AA isn't working for me. You know, so obviously it's leaving AA or something like right. that, which, which is good. Good. Leave AA. That's fantastic. But then they get barraged with, I mean, the threads are a thousand miles long of 
well, I do this, 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 and this, you know, I take this antidepressant, I go to smart meetings, I go to, you know, I, I now take Vivitrol once a month, you know, and, and then the next guy hops on, well, I go to rational recovery, I do this, and, and I'm looking, and nobody's saying, you know what, I just made the choice to, there uh, are a few, yeah, there are some that say that, there are, yeah, yeah. I watch it. I always get happy. I am so happy when I see yeah, something. Like, no, I just figured out I didn't like getting drunk anymore. <laughs> yeah. And, it's and wonderful. It <laughs> is. It is wonderful. And and so my my response is, you know, if you if you really just want to get over the problem for good, read the freedom model, because we'll just show you that what so what's the answer to this question ultimately? How here, let me read the question again. <laughs> and you suggest techniques to help resist the temptation of cravings and relapse. First, know the truth. Find the truth about what addiction is, what is it, what it isn't. And then you know what the answer is? It's you. It's you. It's it's you as a person making a decision about what you value, what you like, what you dislike, and then deciding if you can be happier making a change. And it isn't any more complicated than that. The only reason it is complicated in our culture is because we have gone down this charade of disease and all these now, this, this immense number of programs and modalities that are a distraction to you. You yeah. making a choice. I like to drink for these reasons. Maybe I could like not drinking or moderating or adjusting my use more. And I'll tell you, so what's our technique? Is getting rid of the mythology so you can make a clear-headed decision. Yes, right? yes, and that's not to say that, you know, not to knock, if somebody feels like they have trauma, they can go get help for the trauma that's totally separate. Yeah, you don't have to connect it to you. You don't have to connect it to it's you. It's the so spirit behind doing those things that really matters on all the life improvements, the goal, yeah. the dealing with other problems. Do that because you want your life to be better, but don't do that because you believe you need to to make to to battle addiction. Exactly. Addiction is not real. You know, we have a yeah. desire to use drugs or alcohol that we a preference that we built up, learned, habitualized, and we just got to deal. You know, just deal with that, and make different decisions. And even if everything is perfect in life, that's the thing is you see so many people who have everything in life just right yeah and they still want to use so you got uh, we have a question here steve um it says can you please share any research citations that support the freedom model well david uh the book is 450 pages and there's probably about 100 references <laughs> in that book so i'm not going to read them to you <laughs> is um, there actually 100 citations because i feel like a lot more than that went into it but, yeah, but i'm, I'm thinking there might be more than yeah, that i'm just i'm just estimating but there's a there's a whole there's a whole lot in every chapter of the book yeah uh, you know and me uh, just just look up knee sark um a lot of the data that we have comes right from the the knee sark studies so which are were the biggest biggest research done on addiction to date so and there were three of them right three knee sarks the last well one was, yeah there's, there's uh, a weight one two and three there's also the national the nlaes national longitude yeah. alcohol and something and there's a whole bunch of those epidemiological surveys so that what that supports is that people quit this all the time without help. Yes. And, and that their rates of, of getting over further are just as good or even slightly better in some ways than people who get help, right? So that if a core idea with the freedom model is this addiction thing is a construction. Um, that's a good suggestion that addiction is constructed because if addiction was a real disease that people would get treatment, should do better. I mean, yeah, even though don't. we have no cure for cancer, I'm sure that people who are treated for cancer do far better than the ones who don't get treatment and have it, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Or a lot of diseases, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Right? Of course. Of course, so, or we wouldn't have penicillin. <laughs> so we may not have a surefire cure for cancer, but on the whole, the people that get the treatment do better than ones that don't. 
This is not the case with addiction. Right. So um, the NISARC waves one, two, and three are that that work is cited in here. Um, another, what else? Go yeah, ahead. another great place to find a lot of citations is, is Steve's website, um, which is the what is that? The CleanSlate.org. Uh, yeah, CleanSlate.org. I've got a lot of citations on there. Where do you put the citations in the book? Do you put them at the end of the chapters? They're on the end of each chapter. Yeah. So we do have one more question though that we have to answer, and we're getting short on time already. It's we've only it's 7:45. Um, and this is kind of a long question, and so this will take up the rest of our time. Um, if if opiates aren't the problem with overdose, which I think we talked about in the last one. And, and in that, our podcast. And in our well. podcasts, um, which of course they're not because the vast majority, of, because 100 million people use them um, on an annual basis and, and you know, the amount of overdose is very, very low, um, which he says, which I think is true, kind of, because it's not just opiates, but mixed with heroin and fentanyl, et cetera, and suboxone and methadone aren't the solution, then what is the way to fight the opioid crisis? I'm through so many things asking our opinion on that. Um, first of all, I yeah. think we need to identify what the crisis actually is, right. and it's a crisis of overdose. And and he's right about saying it's a a lot of overdose is mixed substances. Yeah. Um, Most of it is. Yeah. yeah. So so we're not just talking about opiates. Uh, some of it is because of black market drugs. So the way to solve that is by legalization. You know, legalizing drugs and letting people buy them legally and get what they want, and so they know what they're getting. Um, but the other the other side of that too, I I personally, um, you know, people go into treatment now and they get prescribed all kinds of medications, and then they leave, and then they're on all these medications. And when you see a lot of these like movie stars and stuff that are overdosing, a lot of them are taking the medications they're taking. They're mixing them with alcohol. They're mixing benzos, opiates, alcohol, you know, street drugs, whatever it is, and it's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Um, so yeah. treatment itself lends to that. I, I think a lot of people are taking benzos now, and it goes what we were just saying, the idea that, well, addiction is, you know, as it, it's, it's no longer the monolithic AA thing of disease of the mind, body, and spirit. It, it's now... All these different underlying causes and things so they're giving a lot of people benzos yeah um, a lot of people are becoming more involved in the mental health system and getting on drugs that do not mix well with buprenorphine and um methadone and heroin and whatever else right any opioids mm -hmm. um so uh that's a big part of the problem too is it like that they're being prescribed these things and it's uh, even the people who are the biggest promoters of this stuff, like you know, like World Health Organization, they say in their booklet, "Hey, don't give somebody with an opioid pro like if if somebody has a benzo problem or an alcohol problem, do not prescribe them any methadone or buprenorphine and stuff, right? Like, right, say, right." In World Health Health Organization, they even know this is a problem. So, it it is, but we're talking about a big giant cultural problem too yes yeah that's i here here's the answer the sh the short answer to this question is and this is going to sound like i'm shamelessly pushing our book but the truth is if everybody had our book they could make an educated decision because we dispel all the stuff and that that's the confusing misinformation yeah. so it's a two-pronged approach one is legalization so that people if they decide that they enjoy getting high they're not taking stuff that's laced with fentanyl or other things. Um, so so you have, they know how strong it is. When when yeah. you buy whiskey, you know it's yeah, usually nice. eighty proof, forty percent alcohol. You pour a shot and a drink. You know and get it. You're getting one standard drink. Same thing as a beer. You know exactly what you're getting. And that's a great example. A shot yes. glass, a glass of wine, and a beer are all the same. And and basically by 15, even by your drinking buddies, oh, you yeah. got that all now you down tight. Know. And nobody's puking and, and you know yeah. overdosing anymore. Um so so if that's that's what legalization does, is it standardizes that whole process to a very safe level. And we know this, this experiment's done in other countries, and so legalization works. Um, that would be a huge shift 
for our government and that. So I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. So the flip side, the other part of this is understanding that the solution is you and that addiction doesn't happen to you. And most importantly for the opioid crisis is not teaching our children that if they take a pain pill because they broke their leg last week, that they're going to go out and have a needle in their arm the following week. Yeah. And that if they, if they like the pain pill, that suddenly that, that, that they're always going to like it, that their brain is changed and rewired. And suddenly they're a zombie that's out there going to, going to the crack house or the shooting gallery. That kind of mythology in health classes, for instance, is what is driving kids uh, to this, what they believe is an unavoidable road to addiction. And it's incredibly powerful in a bad way. Yeah. So, so I think that, that the, to, to switch that cultural shift away from teaching youth that they're susceptible to addiction is a massive piece of the puzzle. And we got to stop doing that. I, I hear public talks. I tell mm. my, my health teachers in the schools that my children, I gave them copies of the freedom model. And they were like, if I teach this, I don't have a job. Right. You know, I said, they said, oh my God, this is right on the money. I can't believe I've been teaching kids the wrong thing. So, uh, yeah, so I think there's a no, lot of it, things that need to happen. I, absolutely. I, I think that we, we did cover that pretty well. Um, but that is the key is teaching the truth from a young age, changing treatment completely to, to, uh, to the truth and, and to detox only. To detox only. If if you if you have a, a problem with heroin uh, or any opiate, go to detox. Understand that you can move past the problem and move on with your life with whatever usage pattern you desire thereafter. Once you know the truth, there's nothing to be scared of. I I, I want to talk quick too about a call that I had today um, from someone who who was really troubled because he's on high dose methadone now. He was put on it. He said he only was doing heroin for a couple of years. And now he's on this methadone. He doesn't want to be on it. He went to the clinic. He told them he wanted to get off of it. And they basically told him, tough luck. You're an addict. You're going to have to be on it for the rest of your life. And they, you know, because he has to go to the clinic and take his dose in front of them. He's like, I would like to taper. Can you help me taper? And they won't help him do it. And and the people that we know that are in that are MAP proponents and in harm reduction are are basically saying to us that doesn't happen. I know, and we get calls every day like this it's now with people that are like, I want to get off of it. Yeah. I don't need it. I, I literally I feel like I'm a slave to this now. And, and I and I don't see it as being any different. I don't want to use heroin anymore. And I don't want this. And and so so you know this kind of goes to this i mean when you teach people not only are you teaching people that you're going to be craving opiates forever and that you're going to be this opiate addict forever but now you're also shoving medicine in their face and saying you've got to take this medicine or and and let me jump in there it's not medicine yeah it's not medicine it's no more medicine than taking oduls for an alcohol problem right i i'm going to go back to that because it's so comical but <laughs> Honestly, honestly, right? We don't say take your O'Doul's today because you're an alcoholic and that's the only way that's the best you're going to do, Sonny, you know, and, and this idea, the standard is now calling moderate use of heroin as medicine for a heroin addiction because that's all methadone and suboxone are. In time release. Is time release heroin. Well, timer, yeah, it's very important. It's a crappy version. Of, of heroin because what are doing? Yeah. it just slowly stays in you forever. And if you want to get I'm high, you can't get a spike because of this shit is still in you. It's so bad. It's so and, and here's the problem. We call that medicine now. Yeah. Addiction and, medicine. And addiction medicine. And it's not medicine, folks. It's, it's just a distraction from the fact that if you really want to be done with this, you can be. You can be. Absolutely. And look at, I'm not saying, I'm not not, I mean, if people want to do it, oh, I, agree. I look at, I, 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 agree. I, it's okay with me, but just know what it can do for you and not do for you. Right. That's all that I just sure. know the truth. Yeah. It's, it's not medicine. It's not medicine. I mean, we're just talking about legalizing all drugs. 
you know, so I'm not saying that people shouldn't be able to have access to methadone or some. Well, those could, they could be pain medicines, methadone. Yeah. Physical pain, methadone and buprenorphine can be that kind of a medicine. Yeah. For addiction, right. since addiction right. is or not existed, right? It can't be a medicine for that. Right. <laughs> it really can't. Exactly right. So, so yeah, I think I think that that covers that question. Um, let's go over everything that we offer. Yes, yes, we're coming. We're coming to five minutes here. We have five minutes left, and um, we do have a number of services that we offer for people if they're struggling from anything from free yeah. books and free videos on our YouTube channel. Um, to we do these Facebook lives every two weeks. Yep, we have the Addiction Solution podcast. We have a lot in the archives now that you can listen to. Um, we have right the Freedom Model for the Family, which is that book. This book. <laughs> and then, of course, the Freedom Model. This book. <laughs> and the Freedom Model retreat for somebody that really is immersed and caught and stuck. Like and I had some time away. Like yeah. I, I was the first person at the original research project retreat back in 1989. Um, so uh, I was the first guest. Um, so some people just need that time away from the chaos of their life. We have uh, private classes that we offer with Steve. Yep, you can yep. have video conference classes with Steve. That's called private instruction. So you can find all this information at thefreedommodel.org, mm -hmm. silverforever.net. Then the research is thecleanslate.org and baldwinresearch.com. Now, obviously, after the live event, you can watch that and get all that information again if you need to. Yeah, he'll probably put and, it up on the screen, too. Yeah. And, you know, can I add something? Yeah. What really speaks to what I was saying before, it used to be monolithic, just the 12 step thing. And it was, am I gonna accept that I fit that mold or not? And then what it's become now, the narrative that everybody doesn't know that they're going by, but they are, is that if you feel addicted at all, you are, but don't worry, you might not be the kind of addict that goes to AA. You might need this, that, the other thing. <laughs> I, you know, it's uh, we're now accepting that everybody is an addict and they need dip, and they just different, different solutions. And people are getting lost. And the worst is when you see somebody that's tried fifty different things. Oh, I, I know. know, I know that's and weird. and and they're missing the point. So now, what we try to do with the freedom model, we're bringing in a completely new narrative that we believe is the truth based on research, which is like, look, you're just doing what you want to do. It's not whether or not you're an alcoholic. Is not getting trying fifty different you know treatments until one makes your addiction go away or puts it in check. It is you figuring out what you want out of life, what level of substance use works or doesn't work in your life. Whether you want to totally get rid of it, do it to a lesser degree. It's really just figuring out what you want. Yeah, and we help people do that. We give people the truth, and they say, "Now you figure out what you want." It isn't about indirectly making your cravings go away with some treatment. And you just learn the truth and you make your choices. And that's radically different. And that's where we want the whole country to go. And if it did, then yes, this opioid crisis would probably go down. Well, there's another part to that. It, and it's not about that you're a bad person. It's not about that no. you shouldn't like what you like. Yeah. It, you know, drugs and alcohol aren't, aren't immoral. To use them, people use them every day. They've been around since the beginning of time. I, it's 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 not about any of that. You don't have to feel bad. You don't have to look at character defects. You yeah. don't feel like you're damaged or you're a horrible person or yeah. self-centered or self-absorbed. I mean, maybe you are. I don't know, but it doesn't have anything to do with you wanting to get high or drunk. You know, yeah. it's about figuring out exactly what's going to make you happiest in your life. It could be heavy drug use. It could be a change. Yeah. And, and so if anybody reads our books, podcasts, comes to personal instruction or the retreat, we're trying to get them into that frame of mind with the truth and just figuring out what they want and instead of this lifetime of treatment. So I, I just wanted to add what we're aiming for with all of that. Right? Yes. Yes. All right. I think we're up at the hour. Thank you so much, Steve and Mark and everyone. Thank you for joining yes, us. Thank you. And we will be thank back you. in two weeks. And we're going to, we might have a special guest in two weeks. Steve doesn't even know about that. I'm going to talk to you about that. No, later. I don't. <laughs>
<laughs> we're very excited though, but we'll make the announcement at some point in the next week or so. All right. All right. Bye everybody. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 <laughs>